Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, His Excellency Arthur N. R. Robinson, other distinguished members of the head table, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Yesterday, <clears throat> when he was giving his uh, presentation, Ambassador Chris Hack Hackett from Barbados uh, enjoined us all to go and look at the very good display, I think, of the life and work of uh, His Excellency Mr. A. N. R. Robinson. And uh, I, I hope that most of you went and looked at it, because what I'm going to do is just to compliment that exhibition by making some comments on the team A. N. R. Robinson's long road to the International Criminal Court. In the year 2000, the then President of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, His Excellency Arthur N. R. Robinson, anticipating the establishment of the ICC, reminisced about his campaign for the setting up of that body. And I quote, My own involvement in this matter has been long, and may I say arduous, but very exciting, having regard to the value of an institution such as an international criminal court for the implementation of international penal law and humanitarian law, in particular, in a very effective manner." End of the quotation. That struggle was indeed long and arduous, spanning just over half a century, culminating happily in the establishment of an international juridical organization which emerged just in time to act as a deterrent to increasing international terrorism, genocide, ethnic cleansing, and piracy. The long road to the ICC can be traced back to the early 1950s when two bright young men crossed paths at Oxford University. In 1953, Robinson, having just been called to the bar in London, was admitted to read for the bachelor's degree in politics, philosophy, and economics at Oxford. He immediately joined the Oxford Union, that nursery for so many British and Commonwealth politicians, where he met and established rapport with another ardent debater, Robert Wurzel, who was then writing a PhD thesis on the subject of the Nuremberg Trials in International Law. Prior to Robinson's arrival at Oxford, Wurzel and others had formed the Oxford Political Society to which Robinson was invited. This was the start of a long and fruitful relationship between the two men which ended with Wurzel's death in 1991. During this period, Robinson partnered Wurzel in the long haul towards the ICC. In 1971, Watzell invited Robinson to a conference in Racine, Washington, whose purpose was the setting up of building blocks for the ICC. On that occasion, Robinson planted a, bl a blue spruce, which grew sturdily as the ICC also advanced. Three decades later, when the ICC had become a reality, Robinson was invited once again, this time without Wetzel, to celebrate the new birth. The spruce, a sapling in 1971, now a 30-foot specimen, overshadowed the gathering in April 2002. That evening, Robinson confided to his diary, this was a most satisfying moment for me. And that spruce is part of the uh, pictorial exhibition that is there in the library. When you go, you, you'll see the spruce um, still there. The su successful establishment of the ICC was due in large measure to the harmonious relationship which developed between Robinson and Wetzel. During the late 1970s, they had both shared fellowship at Harvard University when much of the research work was done. When Robinson felt that his life was threatened during the run-up to the 19. 76 general elections in Trinbago, he appealed to Wetzel to alert the international community. And just before his death, Wetzel dedicated his last work, the Code of Talleries, to his longtime friend, Robinson. A second major influence on the road to the ICC was Robinson's time at Oxford. 
The young scholar interacted with eminent literati such as the historian Max Belloff and the philosopher Isaiah Berlin, and he found time to interact with leaders of the Mau Mau struggle in Kenya, led by Jomo Kenyatta himself, a former activist in the UK. Robinson became actively in, involved in the debate about Europe's African colonies. In 1954, Robinson and other Afro-Asian people drew enormous inspiration from the Viet Vietnamese defeat of the French forces at Dien Bien Phu and the forward movement of Asia under dynamic Asian leaders. And then in the next section, which I'll have to truncate considerably, I talk about the, 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 the period in the Caribbean when Robinson uh, was growing up and when he, he entered politics. This was a time when colonial peoples worldwide were deal breathing the fresh air after the long and dreary Second World War, which had provided a convenient European pretext for the withholding of political reforms in the Caribbean. Now, in the aftermath of the war, leaders were emerging to organize struggles everywhere. George Padmon, Kwame Nkrumah in Africa, Nehru and the followers of Gandhi in India, and Serkano in Indonesia. In the Caribbean, there arose leaders such as Fidel Castro, Eric Williams, Norman Manley, Alexander Bustamante, Grantley Adams, Chedi Jagan, and A.N.R. Robinson. Um, Nelson Mandela, only eight years older than Robinson, had blazed a trail for his generation by resorting to armed struggle, which resulted in lengthy trials from 56 to 61, followed by an equally long incarceration from 1962 to 1990. Caught in the spirit of the times, Robinson did not tarry long in the wings. In 1956, he joined Eric Williams to form the People's National Movement, serving as that party's first treasurer. In 1956, he had his first taste of electoral politics when he fought against Fargo, APT James, who had occupied the sole Tobago seat in the parliament from 1946. Um, and now in 1956, Robinson was, was challenging him and he was beaten by Fargo by, by just 240 votes. However, the Castara kid, as Robinson was known, returned to beat Fargo in the general elections um, of 1958 and then in the federal elections for a seat in the federal parliament. After this election, Robinson was appointed Minister of Finance. In 1966, when there were two contestable seats in Tobago, Robinson won the Tobago East seat after which he became Minister of External Affairs, a position which he held until 1970 when he broke with the PNM in the aftermath of the February Revolution of that year and the Army Revolt in April 1970. And then I go on to talk about Robinson's ascendancy um, until he became President of the Republic, a position which he held until March 2003. And I go on to talk about some of the real difficulties that, that, that he had, for example, in 1976, in the full public view, he was arrested and lodged in the Scarborough jail alongside three of his colleagues, and, and I was one of them. I shared a room in the prison with, for two nights with uh, Mr. Robinson, and then we had to stand up in front of the Scarborough magistrate for three days to be interrogated. But then we were freed and, and, and compensated later on. 